welcome to all from all corners of the world. It's so great to, to have you here for our second online session in the career uh, workshop. Um, so our speakers today are uh, Dr. Margaret Teresa and Tom Seymour, both working in the infrastructure sector. Margaret and Tom will present for 15 minutes each on the different sectors they have experiences of and um, share with you the tips for finding a job. So we will open for a question after they both present. And uh, just so you know, the session is being recorded. We will first start with uh, Margaret. Uh, she is the head of economics and business advisory at uh, Jacobs, uh, supporting clients across the world to deliver sustainable investment in infrastructure programs. She has worked for decades providing economic and policy advice to the Mayor of London, the Greater London Authority, and the Transport for London. She has served as the Chief Advisor to the London Fairness Commission, and she's currently serving as an independent expert advisor for the Mayor of London's Industrial Strategy Evidence Base, and has recently been appointed to the Mayor's Infrastructure Advisory Panel. So um, welcome, Margaret. Uh, I'll you. hand off to you for now. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me today. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I was asked to, to kind of talk you through my career to date, which really had me contemplating how I ended up where I am, which is always an interesting thing to do in life, I think. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk to you a bit, first of all, about Jacobs. So this is a company that I'm currently working with. It's a, it's a very large organisation. There's 55,000 employees worldwide. Um, but, but in the UK specifically, it's relatively unknown um, to the general public or to people outside of the infrastructure sector. And it's, that's changing rapidly as we, kind of, we transition away from being a typical engineering consultancy firm more towards being a solutions provider across the piece. So we it originated in America. Um, our largest clients are people like NASA. Um, so we support infrastructure across the piece. Uh, we've got the next slide. So our, our kind of strap lines, which we've only recently launched, are challenging today and reinventing tomorrow. Um, the values that we work to are to do things right in the first instance, uh, challenge accepted approaches and make sure that we're always pushing best practice and improving our approach in life. Aiming higher, this is very American sounding for me, but we aim higher and we live inclusion. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about my career to date. So I um, did a lot of studies early on in my life. So I chose to go to the University of Liverpool to do geography because it was the largest geography department at the time. And I was very keen to have a breadth of offer that was available from there. Um, I also grew up in London and wanted to move away from home. So it was, a, it was a city that was far enough away for me to actually justify leaving home in the first instance. And it was a relatively cheap place to live, which, um, which made me kind of, uh, which was very fortunate for when I was studying. Uh, when I came out in the 1990s, we were in a bit of a downturn, so a bit of a recession. And I had considered going straight into a job, but geography was very broad and I didn't think it had really set me up for a career. So I moved, so I started an MSc at Cranfield University um, and I was attracted to that university because it was very much an applied science place to study. Um, and I did applied remote, uh, applied remote sensing there, which is use of satellite imagery, aerial photography for land use. Um, so I spent a year there becoming very technical, which you would not believe nowadays, given I can't even get onto a Zoom call easily. Uh, I learned to program. I was doing a lot with geographic information systems, uh, which was very new in the early 90s and not you know, as simple as you see on Google Maps today. Um, so after my year there, I went and worked with uh, a local authority called Hertfordshire County Council. Um, where I implemented a GIS system, an environmental information system. Had an amazing time, worked with really lovely colleagues there, uh, really learned how the public sector um, applies itself to protecting the environment generally, and where the limitations of public policy are and how it interfaces with the private sector. 
Um, I was then enticed back by Cranfield University uh, by a couple of um, professors there who approached me and offered me a teaching scholarship, which um, gave me an opportunity to pick whatever subject I wanted to study to do for my PhD. It wasn't constrained in any way. Um, and also an opportunity to teach on the, on the master's course. Um, while I was there, I set up my own uh, independent consultancy as well. So I used to do geographic information solutions for um, the public sector, so for local authorities. And also I was working with a few start, uh, tech, up, tech startups. So people who are working in the sports industry and things like um, whether you could uh, determine things like ra horse racing uh, courses, whether you could determine whether a horse was going to do better or worse given the going. So they invented things like the going stick, looking at things about how you can do better land use of golf courses and drainage solutions using geographic information systems. Uh, so I had a lot of fun. I was really very busy when I was doing my PhD. <laughs> it was a partly study, partly teaching, partly doing consultancy. Um, after that, I went and joined the National Health Service um, up in Birmingham, which was a very different move for me, a city that I thought would be like a miniature London, but in reality is nothing like that. Um, and there I implemented an internet mapping system for the public health observatory. So for to, um, today they, they would be using it to help combat COVID. Uh, it was pulling together information on a mapping based system and this was years before Google existed and you could do everything on the click of a of a click of a, a web browser. Um, so that was I had a really fun time up there and finished off my PhD while I was doing that job. Um, after that I didn't really enjoy Birmingham as a place to live so I wanted to move back to London. Um, and then I joined the Mayor of London's office. Um, I initially went in as a knowledge manager, so all of this technical background about how you, how you really kind of use information and data to fix things is how I entered the Mayor of London's office. Um, and then I stayed there for 10 years. And during that period, I was promoted into setting up and running the economics function. Um, and then combining all of the different analytical functions into an intelligence unit uh, that included things like demographics, uh, it included the statisticians, the, um, and the engagement of the public, so opinion research side as well. Uh, so when I was with the Mayor of London, we were doing all sorts of very innovative things. So I joined just as we were putting congestion charging in, um, I was there when we won, you know, part of the bid team that won the original 2012 games. Um, and then very shortly after that, there was the uh, bombing on Tavistock Square and how you can bring a community together at times of difficulty. Uh, we had a lot in my team of setting up the initial London plan and the evidence base to support that. Uh, so I think my first five years working with Ken were really kind of a opened me up to a lot of innovation, a lot of different thinking and around city spaces, which was really good fun. Um, and then uh, Boris Johnson was elected. So I spent five years with him supporting the delivery of the Olympics, um, putting in less infrastructure, I would say, um, but we were doing things around the, um, uh, we were doing things around improvements to the underground network at that point. Um, and looking to see how we could make better use of the private sector in delivering information, uh, sorry, delivering services. After that, I um, went back into independent consultancy. So I spent seven years working for myself again, where I was working with the likes of Airbnb, who are kind of emerging onto the scene and were facing a lot of challenges from cities who weren't quite sure how to deal with this disruptive type technology. Um, I also worked with Uber on that as well to position them better for people to understand what the impacts are of these types of industries on a city space. I did a lot of work with think tanks, um, so the Urban Land Institute and the Centre for London, and I broadened my wings to actually leave the UK and started working with international governments. Um, so I was delivering services for the New Zealand government and the Australian government at that point. Uh, I also worked as an expert advisor to a range of private sector organisations, uh, predominantly in the real estate area. Um, so after that, we had Brexit. <laughs> um, Brexit made, meant that many of my, my clients uh, were postponing what they were getting up to. It's like they still wanted to consider all of these ideas, but they were temporarily on hold. Um, so I was on holiday and I thought, what I'm going to do is get back into the world of work. 
Um, so I approached somebody in Jacobs that I'd worked with previously who introduced me to people in that company. Um, and I was brought on as one of the directors of the economics function. Um, we've restructured since I've arrived. So I've taken over the running of the team. And I now have about 70 people that work with me uh, to deliver economics and business advisory services. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so the types of projects that we're working on, it's really fascinating for me to move from a very strategic level to a delivery level. So I'm really enjoying that aspect of the job. But the types of things that we're, that we're supporting on are things like Heathrow expansion. Um, so how do you take one of the world's busiest airports that's not ideally located in terms of position um, and expand that in a way that sort of is that ensures that we've got the transport provision that we need in the future but we're also doing it in the most sustainable way possible. Uh, we're supporting on the Lower Thames Crossing which is one of the largest road schemes that have been implemented in the UK since the M25 was built. Um, uh, Meridian Regeneration which is a £7 billion scheme based in Enfield, uh, we're supporting on the master planning and technical advisory to that um, client there and that's looking at things like affordability of housing how do we make sure that what we're building is actually affordable to local residents but we're creating the spaces and um, locations where people would want to come and live and work because importantly it's meant to be providing 10,000 uh, new homes as well as 6,000 new jobs um, and given COVID, you know, the world of work is rapidly changing so how does the built environment change to adapt to those changes uh, we're supporting Edinburgh as it evolves its city centre, a beautiful city, historic, lots of um, issues around transport, lots of people visiting for certain periods of the year. How do you make that a city, an area where people want to, uh, where it becomes a people focused rather than necessarily transport focused? Um, so we're doing things like introducing a low emission zone into that city, but also the whole concept is to put people first rather than putting transport first. And that's been something that I enjoy going up to Scotland to do, but I'm doing it now from, from home, <laughs> so that's fine. Uh, we're supporting on Crossrail. So this is something that I was working on when I was with the Mayor of London. So I'm uh, very pleased to be involved in the actual delivery of that, as well as the strategy about why we should be implementing it. And I'm looking forward to when it actually opens to see whether all of the modelling we did uh, many, many, many years ago actually works in practice. Um, we're also supporting on High Speed 2 and the regeneration and renewal of the Palace of Westminster. Uh, so one of the most iconic buildings in the world. How do you make that a place that's fit for Parliament as it goes forward? Uh, we do work not just in the UK, but some of my colleagues are working on high speed rail in Abu Dhabi. We're doing land use planning in Sarawak, which is a really interesting location out in Malaysia, um, particularly with the move of the capital city of Indonesia onto that island. Uh, we're supporting the New Zealand government on how to get Wellington moving and implement more pr public transport into that area. Um, and I'm also very keen to push forward inclusive growth um, and to make sure that when we're investing, it isn't just benefiting those at the top of the kind of income spectrum, that it does deliver benefits across the piece. So we're doing that through a partnership that we have with a company called Symmetrica Jacobs. Thanks. Next slide, please. Um, what we've been doing in response to COVID, I mean, obviously COVID has changed the world as we know it, and it's likely to change what we do going forward. Um, so our first response was around how we keep our people safe. Um, we mobilised a, co a global COVID-19 critical response team, and that was to get people able to be able to support our clients and keep, keep, serve, you know, keep people safe while still being able to work. Um, we stopped all global travel immediately. I had to try and get people back from projects they were delivering overseas, um, which was challenging given the rapidly changing environment. And one of my colleagues was uh, kind of stuck in New Zealand for about six weeks before we could bring him home. I mean, he was busy working, but I don't think that was a particularly pleasant time for him having to work out of a hotel room. Uh, we do proactive communications with employees, so our chief executive out in the States has done, is now doing a weekly call with all 55,000 of us, um, so that we're kept very informed about what's going on in terms of not only you know, like what we're doing, but the impact it's having on our client base. 
and uh, as a company we're very focused on mental health um, so given the stress that people are going through and adapting to these circumstances we have a very strong focus on how to support people uh, and and to encourage mental health and then at the moment we're planning how we're going to return to the workplace and what that means um, given that remote working has been remarkably successful for us as a business so does that mean that we'll no longer be operating in an office as much as we were previously uh, we've been doing a lot to support our clients um, so helping them to transition to remote working, using our skills and technologies to help them to respond. Um, so we've been doing things like identifying the PPE needs of care homes in London and making sure this was after it emerged that they weren't getting the services that they needed um, and how you can best, best react to that. Um, and then we obviously do things like design lifestyle science facilities um, to help hopefully deal with the crisis in terms of creating vaccines and therapies. Okay, can we move on to the next slides? Um, how the wider consultancy sector has responded to the pandemic is really varied. It depends very much on um, the cash flow situation of different companies. So clearly a lot of our clients are the public sector um, and they've been deferring investment decisions. This has meant that we don't have as much immediate work as we would be expecting in our current, as we would be expecting usually. Um, and it's not that these projects are necessarily gone but they are being deferred and being de delayed. Um, the responses of not only Jacobs but the wider sector have included identifying new service lines immediately so it's how do we support our current clients um, to actually meet the, the challenges of COVID. So an example of that would be things like um, use of internet of technology solutions so that we can track people who are on construction sites to make sure that they are abiding by social distancing rules. And if required, we can do a track and trace service for people. Uh, we've been making use of the government support schemes. So we have been furloughing some of our staff. Uh, what this means in practice is that we, people who are not so busy, um, we asked them not to do any work for the company and the government has supported a certain proportion of their wages and we've been topping that up. Uh, we've had a freeze on recruitment and that's ongoing, which is not necessarily good news for your ears, but I wanted you to be aware that we, uh, we will be recruiting again in the near future. Um, and then we have made uh, our colleagues, actually not our colleagues, other companies have made a series of redundancies. Um, we're in a better cash flow situation, so we've not had to do that to such an extent. Uh, other, other companies have reduced working hours, so people are being asked to work um, fewer hours, sometimes uh, with, a, with an associated pay decrease. Uh, and others have been asking their staff to work, to, to have a pay decrease without working fewer hours. Um, we as a company made a strategic decision to maintain the number of staff that we have. Um, so we've been, we, we don't intend to make redundancies. And we've also introduced an, a new tool because we work all over the world and we have staff with lots of different skill sets all over the world. Um, this tool is uh, alerting people to opportunities to work in different projects. So I think that will actually change the nature of how we deliver projects in the long run and make us even more globally um, uh, globally kind uh what's the word integrate like a more globally integrated team i mean we already do that to a certain extent but this tool allows that to work even further uh, so I, I wanted to give you a quick card about uh, challenge changes to our early careers recruitment process um just to let you know that we have hundreds of applicants for every job that we advertise and it's really important that you can make yourself stand out from these hundreds of applicants that we get. Uh, we don't look at them as a team until our HR colleagues have shortlisted them. So if you don't make it for an HR shortlisting, you're not even going to be considered from our point of view. Um, they are planning on introducing gamification testing and adopting a virtual online process rather than we did a lot of, we used to do a lot of recruitment through bringing people together and doing in person um, recruitment days but we're moving away from that approach and uh, we're also moving towards a personality attitudinal based recruitment approach uh, before we'd always look at who had the best technical skills but because the nature of our work is constantly changing we're now looking for people who are going to be adaptable and versatile and who'd be able to switch between teams as they progress their career within the company 
Um, we are we're still to confirm when we will reopen our graduate scheme. We offer apprenticeships as well, uh, which I introduced into our team. So they study an economics degree at the University of Kent and uh, we have intern opportunities. But stay tuned and keep an eye out on our website. Uh, all of our job adverts are available on there. And I will send a DP, I'll send the DPU an alert when the jobs become back at, uh, re advertised for us to share with our networks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, for me, I think you are facing really challenging times. Like, realistically, we're entering what is likely to be a very deep recession. Um, so, I think the, the just kind of general advice is. Uh, maybe that means that you have to be broader in what your opportunities that you're seeking if you want to work in career a and job opportunities are available that are aligned in career b and c go for them don't be so focused on trying to reach your main objective in the first instance uh, and don't be afraid to fail you know like if you get if you go for jobs you're not always gonna jobs you're not always gonna be shortlisted but don't get too despondent from that um, and do just continue to kind of push forward and push forward your own ideas about what you want to do. Um, I always encourage our graduates to have a continued plan for learning. So the people that I've put on furlough, we set up a whole development scheme for them um, so that they could learn new skills while they're while they fundamentally not delivering projects for our clients. Um, so a lot of them are looking into things like Python and R. Um, and they're also looking into, you know, like general economic training and how to improve themselves while they're not delivering for our clients. A key during times of downturn is to be adaptable um, and is to kind of make use of every opportunity that comes your way. And, uh, and do use your networks to identify job opportunities. Um, when I was transitioning between roles that I've had, it was often from people, you know, like where I was saying I'm thinking of a change. And I would talk to different people and they would tell me what opportunities were potentially coming up within their companies. Um, that was particularly important when I was working for myself is to, for new, you know, like new clients to come forward. It was really important to, to kind of really flex your network, but the same would go for employment opportunities. And for, for us, we, we actually um, give an incentive for people if they recommend people to us as a company. So we pay our employees if they successfully bring someone forward and they're successfully recruited. It doesn't go for the early stage careers, but that happens in later life. So that kind of demonstrates the value that we put onto networks. Um, so just to let you know that we do have lots of applicants for every role that we advertise. Uh, and for me, it's you need to think about what your key differentiators are. Um, demonstration of work experience is always going to put you ahead of somebody who has no practical experience after studies, um, whether that be from paid work or volunteering work. And um, always include a cover letter where you can demonstrate your enthusiasm for the role or the company. Uh, that's one of the ways that our HR team will, will shortlist. If there's no cover letter, they, we don't even look at the CV. Just to let you know, so that's a bit of an insider thing. But um, mine, I think that's that's my 15 minutes, I think. so. Or oh, probably longer, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. I think that was really uh, great you gave the reality we're facing for new graduates emerging straight from university in this current climate. It's really, really quite difficult and it also changes the, the rules of the game of even uh, how to apply for a job, how to get an interview and so forth. But it, it, am I correct to say then that because of the current situation as well, people are uh, could be recruited from all over the world, essentially. Could be, could be yeah, they, well, they, um, I mean, we have offices all over the world, so people would have to apply to where they've got a work permit, like work permission to work. So although you would be engaged potentially on projects all over the world, you need a home-based office. Mm -hmm. And for your application to be considered, um, in the UK at the moment, we won't consider anyone who doesn't have work permission to work in the UK. It's, it's been quite harsh, but we've come down on, it, you know, it, it's too expensive for us to do that at the moment. And we've got a selection of candidates who have the right to work that we, we are recruiting in. But because we are an international company, we have offices all over the world. So part of my team is based out in Bologna. So they've actually gone back into the office now and are working from the office one day a week with each other, although socially distanced, um, uh, abiding by social distancing. 
but they've said it's great to be able to have a coffee with each other again so and share ideas because you don't get that so easily when you're working remotely thank you thank you margaret so i will now um i will i am aware of of letting you have your questions i'm sure you have plenty but perhaps we will hear now from tom um and well, I need to. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> Tom was a, a recent graduate, if I'm if I'm not if I'm correct, right? Um, you were in two, last year, right, Tom? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So he was. He, yeah. So he's a DPU alumni, as many of you will be very soon, and he did a UED masters last year, and he's currently head of strategy for uh, Lead Lease Europe, a global property construction and inf infrastructure group with a particular focus on large urban regeneration schemes. So this is why we brought the two together, because you're both working teams on, on infrastructure projects. <coughs> and um, I know you you will go through all the, the things you're doing, so I'll keep this short. But I know you also, um, you sit on the mayors of London Young Professional Advisory Panel for infrastructure. And um, so I'm hoping you can take over now, tell us a bit about how you went about finding the sure. job and also what you do, and then we'll open to questions. Sure. Um, thanks, Rita. And thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here as well. Um, so I'll um, probably concentrate on um, talking a bit about the pathway that I've taken and, you know, decisions that I've made about career. Um, things can look very obvious and um, considered in retrospect, but things often were much more difficult at the time or much more uncertain. So I, I just sort of thought that it'd be useful to sort of lay out how I kind of approached that and, and where I've ended up. So, um, so, so Rita was right. So I, I finished my DPU masters last year. So I did the um, UED masters course. Um, though that said, having I finished it last year, I actually started it in 2013. So that that took a, that was a six-year process, um, which wasn't completely because I was a poor student, um, but there was I was doing it part time and uh, was was working as well. And then there were some sort of work-related um, interruptions, including relocations around the world and that sort of thing. So that, that interrupted things a little bit. But if I just go back to when I left university as an undergraduate, so I, I left university in 2009. Um, <clears throat> I did politics and economics, uh, mostly because I was interested in those subjects and just wanted to keep my options open, you know, do, do as broad a thing as possible to um, work on something I was interested in and not close down options. And then Coming into the working world in 2009, um, I, I thought it's, it's worth sort of pausing it on this because I, I've got a lot of sympathy for what you guys would be going through at the moment. Um, 2008-9 was a pretty nasty time to be in your last year of university. Lots of people had, um, basically all the graduate recruitment rounds were sort of halved or quartered. Um, there was, uh, a lot of uncertainty obviously <clears throat> and it was generally a quite sort of difficult time to then be looking for a job um, and I, I suppose you know th that shouldn't and won't provide that much comfort to you other than to say that you know over time things things tend to work themselves out and whilst that was a sort of really challenging thing to go through um, it is something which everyone you know you, you find a way through and as tough as things can feel at the moment things things will find a way things will find a way to sort themselves out and and i think i um i had to delay sort of and i wanted to get a job immediately because i kind of i think i was kind of done with university i was ready to get out into the world um but i had to delay entering the workplace by about almost a year because um the recruitment, the graduate recruitment that I had intended to go to had uh, basically got paused sort of indefinitely. Um, then there was sort of a bit of time to try and work out what was going on. So I ended up taking a sort of basically a, a sort of a forced gap year um, or gap sort of nine months. 
um, which uh, wasn't what I wanted to do at the time, but actually was fantastic. You know, that was worthwhile doing. Um, obviously, <laughs> had a bit of a different environment in that you could at least go traveling, which um, is not something that is as available now. So I, I can't at all say that it's a comparable experience, but it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. But then that, that informed what I ended up doing. So I, I then went after university into a broad um, graduate scheme at a strategic consulting firm. Um, the firm I worked for is called OCNC. It's a British consultancy. Um, it's uh, a lot of the firms in the sector uh, tend to be American. They're people like BCG and Bain and McKinsey. Um, there are a few European players. OCNC is the, I think, the second biggest British British firm, um, and that was quite a. The attraction to me about that was that it was using and, and giving a set of skills and toolkits um, around sort of how to operate in a, in a corporate environment, um, how to break down really difficult, challenging questions, quite intellectual questions, um, how to sort of persuade people, how to, how to form hypotheses with imperfect information and then test them and come up with commercial recommendations as a result. Um, plus the ability to work on lots of different industries, different sectors, um, typical project length is about four or five weeks. So, you know, I, I worked there for four years, just shy of four years. And in that time, you kind of do many, many projects, lots of exposure to different industries, um, which was great. But through that time, I kind of found that I was, you know, not as motivated by the actual underlying work. I, I was enjoying the sort of the challenge and the stimulus from the, the pace of the work, but I tended to be working on, um, uh, worked in a lot of media companies, worked for a lot of retail companies, um, consumer goods, and, you know, I just didn't care that much about, um, you know, how to make, um, a supermarket's uh, portfolio of shops 5% more efficient. You know, that just didn't, didn't float my boat. And I kind of over time worked out what it was that I was interested in. Um, and that, that was um, essentially how cities worked and how cities developed. That was something which I'd sort of been interested in in the back of my mind um, since I was a student, an undergraduate, but it hadn't really occurred to me that there might be actually a job out there, which is something that I could apply my, my skill set to, but actually work in that sector. Um, but I wasn't sure how to get there really. So I, I kind of took a two pronged approach, which was I applied for a course at DPU. So I applied for the UED course because I thought I, I looked at master's courses is a really good way to sort of um, jump over into different kinds of careers, different sectors. Um, you, learn, you learn about different industries, different um, disciplines. You get some, you build a sort of a bit more of a network contact base. Um, you have a bit of time as well to where you're not working um, as in, in a professional job, uh, obviously working academically, but you've got a bit of time to work out how you might then go forward. So I applied, applied for the DPU um, and then uh, I was extremely fortunate as well that I, um, I had a friend who worked for Lendley's, the company I now work for, who was moving on and needed to find somebody to um, backfill essentially his role and asked if I'd be willing to do it. And I wasn't at all interested in the role itself, um, but I trusted, I trusted my friend. And he, he sort of said it was a good place to go. And they were very accommodating about the master's course. They were sort of completely happy for me to do the master's course part time and just work around that, which was extremely fortunate. And so I sort of thought, you know, what's the worst that can happen? So I kind of gave them both a go. And then ended up, so that was seven years ago. Um, and I've kind of not, uh, I've, I've moved around within Lendlease um, and Lendlease is a 
is a firm, as Rita said, that is concentrating on big urban regeneration schemes around the world, um, headquartered in Sydney. And I actually got an opportunity to go and work in the head office for, um, I was there for actually four years almost. Um, and that's what caused the delay in my uh, master's completion. Working out how to try and attend UCL from Sydney was quite challenging. Um, so that's, that's why I ended up then coming back to London about two years ago, finishing the master's and working in the European business here. And, and the kind of work that we do is um, we work, we generally partner with governments. So um, governments being um, creators of infrastructure um, demands, they kind of will have a pipeline of projects, they will have um, objectives around housing, um, other assets that they want to create, um, other, other objectives they have for urban environments. And they'll need, they'll need private sector partners to come in with them to help them create what they want to do. So an example of something that we're doing at the moment or just beginning is that we're the, we're the partner for the Department for Transport um, for the redevelopment of Euston, the Euston area which I thought I'd put, sort of pause on because it's quite local to UCL and a few of you guys might be familiar with the area. So that's, that, the HS2 train line is, um, at least in theory, gonna come into Euston. There's a huge rebuilding exercise that will need to happen around the station to accommodate that. And what the government wanted, was very keen on, was that the urban form that results, so the, the type of city that we leave behind when that infrastructure work is done, is as best as it could be. And, it, and if you draw a sort of comparison to it, another actual project that Lenny's was also involved in um, a bit more than 10 years ago, that continues to this day, is um, the, the lands around Stratford, around the Olympic area, where that, that was a site which is quite, um, Quite challenged. It's sort of boxed in with infrastructure, and there's obviously the the the, the presence of the Olympics as something that had to happen in 2012. It meant that everything got thrown at it to try and do it as fast as possible. But what resulted is that a bunch of infrastructure decisions were made um, first, and then the city, which is what we're left with now, was kind of filling it in the gaps ever since. And that's why if you if you go to Stratford, it can be quite a challenging environment to sort of work out how you as a person fits into it. There's train lines and motorways going all over the place, shopping centers and that sort of thing. And it, it, it's not really, I think, what a lot of us would think of as the ideal urban form. <clears throat> so what the government then wanted to do with Euston is try, try to sort of bring in um, an urban development expertise as alongside the infrastructure as well. And that's the role that, that we're playing. The other important thing about what we do is that we take development risk, which means that we use our shareholders' money, um, in the case of Euston, that's billions of pounds, to achieve the objectives as well alongside, alongside governments. That means that we have to be very confident that we're getting forecasts around what, what we think the right commercial outcome is going to be, as well as the different, um, you know, environmental sustainability, um, aesthetic, um, different objectives that you're trying to sort of weave across. So, so that's kind of a, a picture of, of what we do. And my role within that is at the moment, I'm the head of strategy, which means looking at what what markets we should operate in, what products we should um, focus on within those markets, and what different, um, you're pro providing somewhere to uh, move, to drive strategic projects, new initiatives, and so on. Um, and that means that I've had the fortune of also looking, looking after first Brexit and now COVID as well. So it's been quite a tiring few years of, um, things that are sort of hitting us from the side without, you know, perhaps us um, expecting, anticipating or, 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 or wanting. Um, but it's been pretty fascinating experience. So we've got 25 odd construction sites around the country 
and construction is an industry which is very very much you know it's like a it's like a race you, there's a there's a starting pistol then you go for two years everyone's trying to run at the end line as fast as they can uh, without tripping over and you try and get there it's basically unprecedented to have to shut that down simultaneously everywhere you know it's, it's never happened and you're in this kind of web of contracts where you're trying to work out who's holding what risk, who's holding what liability. It was, it's been a sort of absolutely gargantuan task just to work out how to shut down, let alone how to start back up again. So it's been a, it's been a fascinating, fascinating kind of um, uh, two, or two or three months, but a very challenging one. I'll, I think I just finished by, um, I think, Margaret gave some excellent kind of advice in terms of what, what to, what to um, look for and how to position yourself in terms of that sort of initial job hunt. Um, I think what, some of the advice that I would give is, is um, be, and maybe this is more applicable in sort of the first few years of a job rather than when you're actually job hunting, um, but, but, but making sure that you have a, a lot of humility and the right attitude to just learn and say yes to things and be just do what you can to help because um you can i remember when i was a student thinking that i knew exactly what kind of things i was interested in or interested in or what i wanted to go and do but the reality actually turned out to be quite different and the other thing is that what what experiences feel like at the time actually is not a good guide to how you look back at them in the past so I look back on some of the things I did as a consultant when I, when I left university and I, and I spent the first three or four years working as a strategy consultant. And at the time, I was kind of quite miserable, working really hard, not that interested in the, in the actual work itself. But I look back on it now thinking that it was an absolutely fantastic kind of apprenticeship in um, how to operate in, in the working world, how to, how to use the sort of analytical skills you get from academia but then applying that to a commercial world working out how to gather data um, test things persuade people who might not come from the same kind of um, thought position as you so i think just being open and being sort of uh, getting as many broad experiences as you can i think is really good advice at the moment particularly so i'll probably just pause there i think we've both gone a little bit over and Got a little bit of time for questions. Thank you so much, Tom. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm watching the time, and I really know that probably most of you would like to ask some questions. So do put your hands up, and um, question for for Margaret or Tom. Any of them? Oops, sorry. Maybe there's a hand up. Um, Antoine, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, Margaret. Uh, Hi. Hope you're well. Uh, first, thank you both and Rita as well for organizing this, uh, this really interesting discussion. So my question is, ma is mainly for Margaret. So I was wondering, how did your PhD help you in your professional career? Because you didn't go into academia in the pure sense of the word. I was wondering if this PhD actually gave you, uh, was it more of a personal uh, maybe endeavor you wanted to um, to do or did it actually maybe I don't know push you towards higher positions or more interesting uh, assignments or something? Um, I think from my point of view the PhD gave me the technical skills that I've used ever since so it was a quality the, the use of modeling you know like so I was involved in satellite modeling you know which is very complicated so the approaches that I learned there set me up really well for dealing with things like urban systems um, I would have stayed. I mean, to be honest, truth is I would have stayed doing satellite imagery and land use mapping had it been better paid at the time, but it was just appallingly paid. So I was being offered jobs from the Institute of Terrestrial Ecology, who I had had a scholarship from, that were paying me less than I got from the work where I was doing kind of admin work in central London bank, you know, banks I used to do during my vacations. So it was, you know, it was, it at the time, it was incredibly poorly paid very very interesting work and I am starting to do more back in with the space sector now through Jacobs it's one of the reasons I wanted to join Jacobs is that they've, they're so strong in the space sector and I miss that kind of the challenge of using that 
those techniques. But um, the reason I did a PhD was it was these two, two professors who came to visit. I hadn't thought about going into doing a PhD at all. And even when I was doing it, I didn't really have the intention to be a, a, a full-time academic. I'm a part-time academic, Anton. I do teach you <laughs> and, and some others. But um, Believe me, I know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah so but it for me it was the skills that it taught me that were the most important thing but because I did it at the time I was running my own consultancy anyway so it was it was you know very new technologies very new techniques that I could bring out to the market but if you want to do a PhD you really have to want to do it because it's a very long process if it took Tom six years to do his MSc that's a taught course um, a PhD is, is, is a very painful process unless you love it, you know. Um, and I was really lucky because I did mine on a topic that I chose. Um, I was very well supported by my like my academic peers at the time. Um, I would have preferred to have done it in a group environment where I could engage with other students, but I was very much doing a PhD in a small team. Um, and so I think that's the things where you know, like large, you know, larger research institutions have a, probably a big advantage on that. Thank you, Margaret. Thank, Thank you. you. I have another hand up from Andres. I know Andres, nice to see you finally after so many emails. He's in Lima, <laughs> right? Yeah, so it's I about you a question. 8 a.m. over here. Woke up, uh, woke up early to see you guys. Thank you very much <laughs> for the inspiration. Um, my question is really for both and Tom and, and Margaret. In both of your life stories in general you've been working close to the private sector what would be the most important challenge you've seen and how did you overcome it by working with the private sector um i think because i've worked in the public and private sector and i think it's the motivations for each that you have to understand really clearly um, and where the kind of where you're aligned with each other and where you're you're against each other. So for me, this is the first time with Jacobs that I've worked in a, an international company that's just huge. Um, and it's very it's you know it's got a very sustainability is at the heart of what we deliver, but there is a strong profit motive. You know, like so in terms of having the time to explore ideas or to to kind of really think about things. Uh, you don't have so you don't have the time to do that. Everything you do is related to a project delivery, and there will be you know we do support kind of innovation. We have these you can bid for some t uh, for some money to cover your time to do longer term thinking, but you have to be really aware of you know, what's the what's the incentives of the company that you're hoping to work with or the organisation, and to make sure that that's aligned with your values as an individual. Tom, would you like to go into that? Yeah, that's it's that's a um, that's a good question. Um, so I think I've always you're right. I, I've worked in the private sector, um, but I've always been interested in policy, uh, which was a big focus of both my undergraduate and master's courses. And the work that I do now, the, the work that Lendis does, is partnering with. It's about partnering with governments. So you need to understand what the public sector is trying to achieve. Which, which then sort of I, I, is what kind of makes me quite interested in it, you know, trying to thread a needle between different types of objectives. But I think Margaret's very right, very correct, that um, you need to understand those different objectives and why different organizations behave slightly differently. Um, and I actually find I, I enjoy working in the private sector because there is a dynamism and kind of drive that sort of keeps everything going the whole time. There's a lot of, um, because you need, you, you have that profit motive the whole time, which isn't something which, you know, I, I don't personally get up in the morning thinking about profit. Um, <laughs> the organization does, like that, because everyone has a budget they're trying to deliver to ultimately. Um, and that actually it provides this kind of tension and motivation and drive to keep things pushing forwards and keep sort of innovating and keep, keep striving, which is exhilarating. Um, and, and I think, you know, in the public sector, there are, there are some public sector organizations which have that, but a, a lot, a lot have different focus, you know, they're, they're a lot more long, generally longer term focused, because they're, they're not caring about short term objectives so much. I mean, they obviously have short term objectives, but they're not concerned about next year's profit, they're, they're trying to think about the stewardship of a jurisdiction, a city, 
uh, a place. But that, that can also mean that you've got um, some of the challenges that come with that. You don't have, the advantage of a profit motive is that you've got um, uh, a kind of a tool, you know, financial statements to, that aligns everybody and tests what, what different bits of the organization are doing and whether they're sort of satisfying the overall objectives. And that can be a lot murkier in the public sector. Um, you look at, you know, organizations like the BBC, which tries to do both and they're sort of constantly tripping themselves up with different um, objectives around uh, or different sort of KPIs. And it's, it's a real kind of balance, balancing act. So I, I think you can, you can do both though. And what, what I've not done anywhere near as much as Margaret, but have begun to do is sort of work a little bit um, as a sort of on an advisory level for the public sector. Um, so working with the GLA at the moment, um, on, on the, in the infrastructure sector as well. And that provides a, a, a way to sort of be mostly sitting in the private sector camp, but also to have a view on what's going on in the public sector and how, how public sector organizations think about things. So you can, you can definitely do both. It's just trying to work out what, what you want to achieve and what, what, what you think your skill sets and characteristics would be best for. And I think going forward, there's um, the, the whole infrastructure uh, sector, there is a lot more partnership going on between the public and private sector anyway. Um, so I, I work regularly with, with both types of clients, but the whole delivery mechanism is changing to much more of a partnership approach. And hopefully, um, you know, that will reduce some of the tensions that we see in current delivery models. Thank you both. We have one other hand, Ashley. I know you'll be waiting patiently. Go ahead. Hi guys. Um, so I just wanted to ask a question because so I'm a part-time student at, at um, and I am basically using my muscles to kind of pivot into a different um, or oh, my career. If you say. And what I find from the both of, of you speaking is that there's a lot of strategic work and you're more on a strategic level at the moment. And I'm just wondering like, while I'm doing my course, I'm realizing that the information is great, but there, I do feel as though there is a lack of that, um, you know, how to, how to position yourself in more of a strategic way rather than delivery, for example, or, or low level delivery. Is there anything that you would recommend to kind of give that um, experience or that where we can find resources to kind of help us um, learn different mechanisms to strategic rather than delivery roles? Ashley, maybe can you repeat the last part for a bit because we cut, we cut oh, off. Sorry. I'm just saying, how do you have any advice or do you have any recommendations of where we could potentially get some of the, or what, what tools we can access to kind of help us pivot from the current rules that some of us may be in into more strategic rules? Okay, I think from my point of view, one of the easiest ways to start to do that is to become involved with think tanks. Um, because they are set, you know, like they're kind of independent organisations that, that consider different issues aside from the political side. Uh, they, they do different funded projects. Um, if you want, you know, like if you want to get into the strategy space, they, they generally don't pay their researchers very well, but they, in, they get you into a network that's enormous. So for an early stage career move, I think a think tank is a useful place to consider if the strategy jobs are not there at the moment. Um, so things like the, uh, you know, the Urban Land Institute, Centre for London, Centre for Cities, uh, these are just some of the ones I'm thinking of at the top of my head. But I you know, like even if you're just engaging with them and attending their events so that you can see who's in the room, um, so that you can understand who you ought to be connecting with, uh, to look for job opportunities you know like say if you're at an event and somebody says something interesting you can go and get in touch with them and say from what you were saying I've you know and kind of open an interesting conversation and see what opportunities that may lead to thank you and, that, and that's something which you, you can actually do now kind yeah of do it now yeah very easily you know in a way that might have been quite intimidating or, or, or you know logistically difficult um, whereas lots of those organizations um, are running sort of webinars and they're constantly having panel discussions which anyone can just dial into so you can just you know dip your dip your toe in and and see what's um see what's interesting so i think that's that's a that's a really good sort of avenue to to look down thank you guys in a way you both highlight the fact that actually maybe 
the situation we're in does provide the opportunities, like you're saying, to really understand what organizations are doing because suddenly they have to be a window to the world. It's mm. no longer this enclosing, but because of the format with which we have to, to speak to the world, we're actually opening up more. So perhaps this is really an opportunity for you guys to really uh, understand what organizations are doing by joining the webinars, by joining any of the sessions that they have. I think that is a very great advice. I am um, mindful of the time, and I just want to say thank you so much, Margaret and Tom, for, for joining us. We really, really appreciate your time, your knowledge, and the honesty with which you spoke. I wish we had a bit more time to really, I had a few questions, but perhaps get them to you and then be able to translate further later to the students. But I just want to thank you so much for coming. And for all of you there, we, I just want to also say that we have the, our next session on the 16th of June. And it's a critical, the critical role of planning practitioners in the COVID era and beyond. Um, and we have uh, Prof. Caroline Stevens, uh, our honorary professor in urban health. We have Dr. Robin Blotch from the CODI. And we have Trisha Haggett from GIS in, GIZ in Colombia. And I'm, I very much hope you can join us for that. But um, just to say thank you so much for joining this one. And thank you again to our speakers who have been really great and giving us great tips thank you yeah, thank you uh, thank for inviting you. us and um good luck with your career progression and i will alert i will let the um dpu people know when we're reopening our opportunities so that people can be can apply but keep an eye on the website it's jacobs.com there's a career section there thank you great thank, thank you so much bye bye thank you. <laughs> bye, bye.